Uh, I, I will share my slides. لا العفو يا فندم انا اسعد ان انا اتواجد معاكم دايما ان شاء الله. كان يو سي ماي سلايدز؟ ممكن تاكدوا عليا شايفين السلايدز ولا لا؟ موجوده يا دكتور ايوه شايفين اوكي نبدا ان شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. أحب أشكر دكتور كريم على الدعوة الكريمة وأشكر دكتور محمد عبد الغني على إدارته الكبيرة للإدوكيشن بروجرام في القسم وتشرف دايما إن شاء الله نتواجد مع حضراتكم أنا اسمي حاتم سليمان أنا بشتغل إنتنسيف كير كونسلتنت في رويال برومبتون أند هيرفيلد إن لندن و... وعندي سترونج انترست في الكريتيكال كير ايكو كارديوغرافي والادفانسد ابلكيشنز اوف ايكو كارديوغرافي في الكريتيكال ايل بيشنتس وكمان اليوز اوف لانج اوتر ساوند في الانتنسيف كير. اي هاف نو ديسكلوجرز ويل اوفر فيو اوف ذا توك ويل بي ديسكسنج ذا فاليو اوف ايكو ان شوك ذا ليميتيشنز اوف ذا يوز اوف ايكو ان شوك وي ويل جو ثرو سم بيت فولز اند بيرلز اون ذا واي and we will finish by some take home messages. So the first question which comes to our mind at the bedside when we see patient with shock, do we need echo to know that the patient in shock? The answer is no, because shock is often as a clinical diagnosis. But then there comes the role of echo when we need to know the underlying etiology of shock and whether there is something reversible or not. And here comes the importance of bedside echocardiography in patients with shock. So shock overall is a life-threatening generalized form of circulatory failure uh, associated with inadequate oxygen delivery to the cells. Most cases of shock are combined. So we often see a combination of um, uh, uh, septic shock with an element of cardiac suppression from sepsis. So it's a combined septic and cardiogenic shock. We often see visoplegic shock after cardiac surgery and after long uh, cardiopulmonary bypass time. But at the same time, patients will have an element of cardiogenic shock. We can also see patients with obstructive shock due to dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction for various reasons, as we will discuss uh, in the presentation, but this will also be combined with an element of hypovolemic shock. So shock is not a diagnosis, but it's a syndrome and knowing the reversible cause is very important and life-saving. So we, we have main four categories of shock. We all know these types of shock, starting from cardiogenic, hypovolemic, obstructive, and distributive. And I argue that we could use echo to troubleshoot every single type of shock with good ac accuracy at the bedside. <coughs> So how do we assess LV function in a patient with cardiogenic shock? I will go a little bit beyond the basic assessment of LV systolic function, because for us, when we think about basic echo, we, may, we talk about uh, visual assessment of LV systolic function. We talk about ejection fraction. It's a very commonly uh, discussed parameter when you talk about left ventricular systolic function. But unfortunately, the fact is that Ejection fraction is not validated in the critical ill patients, and it's not in any of the definitions of shock for various reasons, because it is dependent on loading conditions, preload and afterload. It is affected by the patient heart rate. It relies on the geometry of the left ventricle, and it has limited reproducibility. And it, there are no data to support the use of ejection fraction in the critical ill patients. And I can give you examples. I can have patient in profound cardiogenic shock with high ejection fraction. So the example here is a patient with acute severe mitral regurgitation with flail mitral leaflet or acute uh, uh, papillary muscle rupture. And the patient, despite having hyperdynamic ventricle with ejection fraction 70, even more than 70%, the patient will be in cardiogenic shock because the blood is not going forward in the right direction through the aortic valve. It is going retrograde. That's why 
ejection fraction is misleading in this context. On the other hand, you can find a patient with ejection fraction, and we see this quite commonly, patients with ejection fraction, 20, 25%, and talking normally, walking in the streets, and some of them are even doing exercise because despite the poor ejection fraction, the stroke volume is maintained. And the importance of this is that we tend to rely in critically ill patients assessment on stroke volume rather than ejection fraction. I can tell you that I don't even measure ejection fraction in ITU patients because I know that it will not give me the answer to my question. What will help me giving me the answer is stroke volume assessment. We can use it, but of course we have to use it cautiously. Within the clinical context, we should not rely on a specific number, although there are described values for assessment of VTI and stroke volume, as I will tell you shortly, but it is more useful also as a trend. So we can see the trend in the change in the stroke volume or the VTI after certain therapeutic maneuvers. So this is a, a, a more uh, physiologic concept, which brings us to uh, a certain parameter that we can assess in patients with cardiogenic shock. So if I have a patient with cardiogenic shock and I do the VTI on the left side, which is a left ventricular outflow tract VTI, by assessing by pulsed wave Doppler, the distance the blood travels across the LVUT in one cardiac cycle, and I find it low, so the normal should be more than 18 or 20 centimeters and above. If you find a patient with low VTI, say the VTI is 10 centimeter, 10 is definitely reduced and it signifies reduced stroke volume. But does it tell me which chamber is responsible for this degree of cardiogenic shock? Is it the left ventricle? Is it the right ventricle or is it both? It doesn't because of the interventricular dependence. The left ventricular stroke volume is dependent on the right ventricular function and the right ventricular filling. So having a low VTI on the left side does not specifically tell me that the problem is in the left ventricle. And we need to find specific information to guide me to what therapeutic interventions I need to give. Do I need to, to give pure inotropes to the left side of the heart? Do I need to give inotropes to specifically help the right side of the heart, like pulmonary vasodilators, to try to reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance, giving inhaled nitric oxide if it's available, giving the vitamin, giving melrinone, which is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So that's that comes the importance. And also when we consider mechanical circulatory support, you will not choose the right modality of mechanical circulatory support unless you define which chamber is limiting cardiac output. And here comes the role of the, this concept, which is the total isovolumetric time. So the TIVT is the summation of both the isovolumetric contraction time and isovolumetric relaxation time. And it, we know this from basic physiology, the isovolumetric contraction time is the time from the mitral valve closure until the aortic valve opening. It is the time before systole. And the isovolumetric relaxation time is the time before diastole, and it's the time from aortic valve closure to mitral valve opening. And the importance of these intervals, that they are the intervals in which the heart is lazy, in which the heart is doing nothing. So these intervals should not be prolonged. The prolongation of both intervals, the isovolumetric contraction, isovolumetric relaxation time, together we call them the TIVT, reflects poor performance of the ventricle. And it is specific for the chamber you are measuring. So if you are measuring the TIVT of the left ventricle and you find it prolonged, then you are certain that the problem is in the left ventricle and the same applies to the right ventricle. And this is an example of trying to assess the response to optimization of cardiac output by echocardiographic guidance at the bedside in patients after cardiac surgery. So if I have a patient coming from theater with an epicardial pacemaker and the patient is in cardiogenic shock and I need to optimize the stroke volume and try to see if there will be response to optimizing 
the pacing parameters by optimizing the atrial ventricular delay. So prolonging the atrial ventricular delay and probably trying to increase the heart rate. And by doing this, we will assess the filling time, the time of filling, the transmitral filling, pulse wave Doppler at the mitral valve and then estimating the filling time and also estimating the ejection time, which is the time of ejection uh, between the beginning and the end of aortic ejection. And then we will look at the TIVT, and this is the equation for calculating the TIVT. So there are two ways to calculate TIVT, whether you calculate the isovolumetric relaxation and filling times separately like this, and you then you combine them, or you could, what is described, and this is the iterative method, which was used by our colleagues doing the dyssynchrony studies, is to estimate the total filling time and total ejection time, which is the total time of effective cardiac cycle, and then you deduct it from 60. So this will give you the remaining time in which the heart is ineffective, is not doing anything. And the longer the time, the poorer the function of the chamber at which we measure this. And in this example, you will see a reduction in heart rate by 10 led to a reduction in TIVT from 16 to 10. And by the way, the normal TIVT should be less than 12 uh, seconds per minute. So the, long, the longer the TIVT, the worse. And it also led to increase in the cardiac output from 3.6 to 5.6. And this is a seminal study which was published by um, uh, our team at the Royal Brompton Hospital uh, in the early uh, uh, 2003. And they looked at limitation of cardiac output by total isovolumetric time during the vitamin stress testing in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. And it was a very important and interesting study because it opened our eyes to the value of TIVT in optimizing uh, and assessing the, the cardiac output. And in this patients, they found that the TIVT had a strong inverse relationship with cardiac output during the vitamin stress test and was a major determinant of cardiac output in these patients. And this is another interesting case series which was published a few years ago, looking at, again, what I described as pacing optimization at the bedside guided by echocardiography after cardiac surgery. And after doing the iterative method, assessing the filling time, ejection time, putting them together, deduct them from 60, uh, and then estimating the TIVT, they found that optimizing the heart rate and AV delay on the pacemaker at the bedside led to improvement in cardiac output, improvement in cardiac index, and reduction in the TIVT from high 22.8 down to almost normal values, less than 14. And this was not the only finding. Interestingly, they also found evidence of end organ improvement. The glomerular, the glomerular filtration rate improved significantly, except in one patient with end-stage kidney disease. And in this small case series, all inotropes and vasopressors were discontinued within 12 hours of pacemaker optimization on cardiac output, and all patients were discharged from ITU from within one week. This is a small case series. Obviously, we need to develop further studies and larger number of patients. But this is important because we do it at the bedside and we see clinical improvement in these patients. Another important, uh, interesting concept based on physiological concepts is the, uh, the, the idea of ventricular arterial coupling. So the normal efficient cardiovascular system should have a normal coupling between the ventricular function and the aortic function. So there is a ratio, there is a normal ratio or normal coupling between the end diastolic elastins of the left ventricle and the, uh, uh, the, the aortic elastins. So based on this, the ratio between the uh, arterial elastins of the aorta by the left ventricular elastins should be one, meaning there is normal coupling. They both work together effectively. When this coupling is disturbed, in the context of cardiogenic shock, the pump will fail. So the ventricular elastins will fall because of low efficiency of the ventricle. And due to sympathetic overactivity, 
the arterial elastance will increase. So the aortic sympathetic activity will be elevated. And therefore, the coupling ratio will be disturbed. And this uncoupling will be detected by seeing increase in the ratio to more than one. And this is a basic equation to tell you how to assess ventricular elastance and arterial elastance at the bedside using echocardiography. To get the aortic elastance, you need the systolic blood pressure. You need to estimate the stroke volume the usual way by getting the LVOT, VTI and the left ventricular outflow tract diameter and then estimating the area and putting this into the equation. And then the end systolic elastance of the ventricle also can be estimated by the systolic blood pressure of the patient and the end systolic volume of the ventricle, which can be obtained by the Simpson method. And this is a, 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 an interesting study which looked at the effect of one of the uh, inotropic uh, medications, which was found to improve this uncoupling and restore the coupling in patients in, with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Levosimendan is an inotrope that has unique characteristics. It, it works as a calcium channel sensitizer. So it promotes myosin contraction. So it helps improvement in cardiac function as an inotrope, but it can also lead to vasodilatation. And with this, what they found is levosimendan was able to increase the ventricular elastance and reduce the arterial elastance in the context of cardiogenic shock. And it was restoring this ratio down to the normal one. And uh, you, they, they were also uh, able to demonstrate this in an application, which I also find very useful. And I use it regularly. It's available for free on both the App Store and the Google Play, in which you can have these parameters measured by echocardiography. You need systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, stroke volume, ejection fraction. You need the pre-ejection time, which is the isovolumetric contraction time and the total ejection time. And you can see here the difference in the VA coupling before and after giving the Divosimendan. Remember we said the coupling normally is one. So the coupling before Divosimendan was 2.9, was high because of the failing ventricle. And after Divosimendan, it was restored to almost near normal values. But we should never forget the dark side. And I believe the dark side was often seen as the right ventricle. We focused for many years on the left ventricle. We give it all the attention and then realized that one of the commonest reasons of cardiogenic shock after cardiac surgery is not left ventricular failure. It is right ventricular failure due to cardiopulmonary bypass times. And because the right ventricle is a fragile ventricle, it is very vulnerable to changes in uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. Anything that will increase the pulmonary vascular resistance will affect the right ventricular afterload. And the RV is a pressure sensitive chamber. So hypoxia, acidemia, uh, electrolyte disturbances, atrial arrhythmias, whether atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia can affect uh, in a bad way, the right ventricular function and leads to right ventricular failure. So we should focus in patients with shock, not only on the left ventricle, but also on the right ventricle. So the next type of shock is hypovolemic shock and important to look at the effect of mechanical ventilation on the heart because patients in shock are often ventilated, whether through positive pressure, non-invasive ventilation or through invasive intubation and ventilation. And to understand the effect of mechanical ventilation on the heart, we need to look at several factors. We need to look at the effect on the preload and the effect on the afterload of the heart after positive pressure ventilation. So the general rule is that positive pressure ventilation increases right ventricular afterload and reduces right ventricular preload because of the compression of the central veins and reduction of venous return. And it increases RV afterload by increasing the pulmonary vascular resistance. So the predominant effect after intubation and ventilation is often drop in blood pressure. And some patients may crash, may develop profound hypotension upon intubation. And this is mainly caused by the effect on the right ventricle. And as you can see here, the shift of the interventricular septum to the left side 
because of the pressure elevation of the right ventricle will often lead to reduction in left ventricular filling and always think of the ventricular dependence. Reduced uh, left ventricular filling can be caused by right ventricular dysfunction. And that's why we see patients with intubation, ventilation, especially we, if we put them on PEEP after induction and ventilation, they can develop severe hypertension, especially if they are intravascularly depleted. The effect of positive pressure ventilation on the left ventricle will be dependent on the state of the left ventricle. In other words, the normally functioning left ventricle is preload dependent, but the failing left ventricle is afterload dependent. So if I have a normally functioning left ventricle, the preload dependence will lead this ventricle to develop worsening function after intubation ventilation because of the effect on the right heart. But specific category of patients with cardiogenic shock who have preserved RV function and have after low dependence with failing left ventricle may benefit from post pressure ventilation because it may have effect similar to the inotropic effect on the, on the left heart. But again, this is very specific. And the major rule is that we have to be careful when intubating and ventilating patients because they can develop hypertension due to reduced cardiac output. And to identify the etiology of hypotension and whether it is hypovolemia or not, we need to look at uh, the parameters of fluid responsiveness. So the static parameters that we all used, including the central venous pressure, the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, did not work well. And those are examples here a study that looked at the validity of CVP and, um, and the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. We can see the CVP on the left. CVP less than eight only had a positive predictive value of 47%. And CVP or, and pulmonary artery occlusion pressure with a Swan GANS catheter less than 12 had a positive predictive value of only 54%. So you had a broad number of patients who had false positive and false negatives. So both of them are not reliable indices of fluid responsiveness, meaning they are not reliable to tell me whether I need to give fluids or not as numbers. So what we should use then, we should more rely on dynamic parameters because the previous mentioned parameters are static that parameter. And another static parameter as well, by the way, is the left ventricular end diastolic area or the end diastolic volume, looking visually at the left ventricle and seeing the left ventricle hyperdynamic or not. We use it visually, but we have to use it carefully because it's a static parameter and it relies on the function of the right ventricle. If I see a failing right ventricle, it, does, it doesn't mean anything to look at a hyperdynamic left ventricle because it doesn't mean that the patient is empty. It can or often mean that the patient has a reduced filling of the left side because of failing right heart. But if you see normal right heart with a hyperdynamic left ventricle, then the patient might probably be hypovolemic. So back to the dynamic parameters, we have several items to check. We have the fluid challenge, giving fluid bolus, and then looking at the uh, response to it, the effect of heart-lung interactions on the heart, whether estimating the respiratory variations of the aortic blood flow by, by assessing the velocity of the aortic ejection or the VTI, and also looking at the vena cava collapsibility distensibility indices. And the final test in dynamic assessment is the assessment of passive leg raising. So there are many publications on the vena cava collapsibility, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. And I think th there will be a, a, a lecture uh, in our uh, uh, session on the, the assessment of fluid responsiveness. So I'm not going deeply into the assessment of fluid responsiveness, but I will quickly mention that the most reliable index of fluid responsive, according to the literature, is the superior vena cava collapsibility index. And of course, SVC assessment can reliably be done by transesophageal echo. It is quite difficult to acquire superior vena cava with TTE, unless you have a very skinny and slim patient. And if you acquire superior vena cava by transesophageal echo and obtaining the collapsibility of the SVC by measuring the maximum diameter uh, 
minus the minimum diameter, dividing that by the maximum diameter, multiplying by 100, a cutoff of 36% can identify fluid responses, flops, responders from non-fluid responses. So patients with a high collapsibility index, more than 36% are likely to be fluid responsive and vice versa. And the other uh, index, which is less reliable than the SVC collapsibility index, is the IVC collapsibility index. And this is the equation for it. And of course, we can do it without TUE. We can do it with a transthoracic um, echocardiography. But we need to keep in mind the effect of mechanical ventilation and spontaneous breathing on the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is a, an intrathoracic, uh, is an extrathoracic structure the inferior vena cava. On the other hand, the superior vena cava is an intrathoracic structure. So that's why during positive pressure ventilation, the superior vena cava, which is inside the thorax, will collapse normally during inspiration. And during exhalation, it will expand. Because the IVC is outside the thorax, the opposite will happen. Inhalation will increase the diameter of the IVC, and exhalation will reduce diameter of IVC. And this is important when we interrogate the effect of mechanical ventilation on both SVC and IVC. And then we look at the variability of ejection of stroke volume by estimating the VTI uh, in patients who are mechanically ventilated and then seeing the variability of this VTI. But we can also assess the velocity of ejection as a surrogate for VTI if you are in a rush. So you can see the velocity and then estimate the changes and the variability uh, of the maximum velocity and the minimum velocity in the trace you are obtaining. Uh, and then the cutoff here will be 12.5%, according to this uh, study by Mark Faisal, which has been published almost 20 years ago now. But to utilize these parameters, we should have very strict criteria. We cannot use them if we don't have these criteria fulfilled. Patients should be intubated, ventilated, should not have any spontaneous respiratory efforts. Our tidal volume should be at least seven to eight milliliter per kg. So patients with low tidal volume will not give you a reliable estimation of uh, uh, vena cava indices. Patients should be in normal sinus rhythm because we are assessing the variability. So if you have a uh, an inconsistent stroke volume due to uh, ectopics, due to atrial fibrillation, you cannot use any of the previous parameters. But what is the solution then? If I have a patient who is spontaneously breathing, and we see this a lot, if we have a patient with atrial fibrillation, if we have a patient who has low tidal volume on the ventilator, like patients with ARDS, this is the solution. This is the magic test, the passively grace, which is the only validated test to, utilize, to be utilized in patients who have all these situations, spontaneous breathing, low tidal volume, atrial fibrillation, ectopics, you can use the passively grace. And what you need to do is you need to um, carefully elevate the feet of the bed, not the feet of the patient, because elevating the feet of the patient will trigger sympathetic stimulation by uh, inducing pelvic pain, even in the unconscious patient. And it may falsely affect the afterload and also the blood pressure and the CVP. So what you need to do is to preferably uh, put the patient in Trendlenburg position where you elevate the foot of the bed without inducing pelvic pain and leave the patient for two or three minutes to assess the effect of this autobolus of blood which comes from the deep veins to the central circulation. And if the patient is fluid responsive, you will likely see a change on the VTI. You will see a change in the bedside vital signs, increase in the CVP. You will find increase in the blood pressure. You may find reduction in the heart rate if the heart rate was elevated due to hypovolemia. But we should also be careful in patients who have abdominal intra-abdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome, because these patients may have false negative results. 
And part of the dark side, which has actually joined the dark side recently, because we have never seen it or focused on it previously, is the assessment of the systemic veins as part of the fluid assessment. So it is very common to ask about whether the patient needs fluid or not. But it is also important to ask whether you need to take fluids off from the patient or not, whether you need to diurese the patient or not, not only because the lungs are wet, but also because the kidneys are congested because the systemic venous system is full of fluid. And this has been linked to increased mortality and incidence of acute kidney injury in the critically ill patients. A team in Montreal has developed this and validated this protocol last year, looking at various parameters, uh, the hepatic venous assessment by Doppler, the portal venous assessment by Doppler, the intrarenal arterial and venous assessment by Doppler, and looking at the, uh, the waveform, you could assess the degree of systemic venous congestion. As you can see here, patients with normal hepatic venous flow had the normal ratio between the S and the D waves, and patients with mild abnormality, meaning that there is a mild elevation in the systemic venous uh, fluid, had the reversed uh, uh, SD ratio, and patients with severe systemic venous elevation, like what we see in severe, mitre, severe tricuspid regurgitation, has a systolic reversal uh, of the S wave. Uh, portal venous Doppler normally is monophasic in patients who are euvolemic, but patients who are excessively congested systemically have pulsatility, increased pulsatility of the portal vein. And the same applies to renal venous Doppler. So if you look at the renal vessels here, above the baseline, you have the arterial trace, the renal arterial flow, and below the baseline, you have the venous flow. The arterial flow will give you indicator of the degree of renal vascularity resistance. So the more the congestion the kidney is, the more congested the kidney is, the more likely the resistance index of the arterial trace will be higher. And looking below the baseline at the renal trace, we will see evolving pulsatility of the renal venous flow with increased amounts of systemic venous fluid. And of course, we should not forget about lung ultrasound because now we have seen the assessment of fluid everywhere, but we should look at the lungs. And lung ultrasound should be an integral part of the echocardiographic examination because without looking at the lungs, which only takes a very few seconds or minutes, you will miss a lot of useful information. Lung ultrasound has the ability to detect interstitial lung water with very high sensitivity. Before symptoms develop, before the patient becomes clinically hypoxic, and before any x-ray changes. Mm. And this is an example here of the appearance of stress B lines early with the uh, administration of the vitamin uh, uh, stress testing in this patient before the patient became symptomatic. Uh, and, and this is very important and useful. And actually, this was an editorial that I have written with a colleague uh, discussing a clinical case, which has been um, uh, discussing a patient who was presented to one of the emergency departments in the United States with very atypical symptoms, very mild chest discomfort. He was middle-aged with no risk factors, and he was not even short of breath. And the ECG was also indeterminate. There was nothing obvious. But luckily, the emergency physician was trained on lung ultrasound. So he put the probe on the chest, looking at the heart, looking at the lungs, and he saw a lot of B lines. And the B lines are the sonographic marker of lung water. So he saw a lot of B lines bilaterally, bilateral diffuse B lines, which reflects a degree of alveolar edema, very high degree of edema, despite the patient not being symptomatic. So because of this, they triggered sending the patient to the cat lab because they thought, why would the patient develop pulmonary edema with mild chest symptoms? And when the patient was put on the table in the cat lab, they found the patient had a critical left main uh, occlusion. And the left ventricular end diastolic pressure in the cat lab was very high. So the, the author of this case concluded that lung ultrasound was life-saving in this patient because they would have never thought of sending this patient to cat lab with normal troponin, with mild atypical symptoms and non-specific ECG changes. And this is the uh, different uh, shades of gray for the development of uh, 
worsening of aeration, starting with from the normal uh, aeration on the left side, where we see horizontal A lines, to the development and evolvement of vertical B lines, uh, uh, starting from interstitial edema to alveolar edema, uh, and then the worsening and loss of aeration when the water in the lungs is replaced by tissue-like material or consolidation in what we see in patients with ARDS. But again, there will be another lecture um, uh, on lung ultrasound that I will give you more details on. We can also use lung ultrasound as a correlation to what we see on the CT, and we have used it in patients with COVID-19. And you can see here the good correlation between the ground gloss opacification on the CT as compared to the confluent patchy B lines on lung ultrasound. And this enabled us to reduce the need for CT scans during the peaks of the pandemic, because we were doing lung ultrasound on a daily basis for all patients. The other type of shock is obstructive shock. Um, and I mean, you're all aware of obstructive shock. It can be due to massive pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade, dissection, tension in the thorax can cause obstructive shock. But I would stress on a specific type of shock, obstructive shock, which is dynamic outflow obstruction. And we see it quite frequently in the patients after cardiac surgery. And it's not uncommon in the critically ill patients. And you can never diagnose it without echocardiography. So this is an example of dynamic LV tube obstruction with the classic SAM, the systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet. But you don't necessarily need SAM to develop dynamic LV tube obstruction. Remember, you can develop dynamic intracavitary ventricular obstruction. And I actually see it more frequently than the LVUT obstruction especially after cardiac surgery, especially in patients who are hypovolemic, tachycardiac, vasoplegic, septic with hyperdynamic small ventricles, patients with severe anemia and patients on inotropes. And without diagnosing that with echocardiography, your patient might uh, deteriorate and you may lose the patient because the management is usually opposite to what we do because inotropes worsen the shock in these patients. What you need to do in these patients, once you identify this high gradient, high systolic gradient, whether inside the ventricular cavity or at the LVOT, is that you need to reduce and stop the inotropes, increase the afterload by vasopressors, uh, give IV fluids to try to increase the end systolic diameter of the ventricle, reducing the, the ventricular obstruction, and probably give beta blockers to reduce the heart rate only if the blood pressure allows. And at the end, I, I have put together with uh, some other colleagues uh, this algorithm as a troubleshooting for the utilization of echocardiography in patients with hypotension and shock, starting with visual assessment of the ventricular size and function, both RV and LV. And from that, you will move forward to assessing stroke volume, seeing the stroke volume, whether it's normal, elevated, or abnormally low. If it's abnormally low, you will think and first rule out obstructive shock. And obstructive shock, you will specifically look at signs of PE, tamponade, dynamic LVOT, or mid cavitary obstruction. And if you rule it out, you need to look at left ventricular filling pressures because you need to also consider cardiogenic shock. If you have elevated filling pressures with low uh, stroke volume, then it is most likely cardiogenic shock. And those are the various types, the various parameters um, that we use to assess left ventricular filling pressures. Uh, you can notice here that left atrial strain is included because strain is an important parameter, although it is not yet validated in the critically ill patients. And you will also notice that lung ultrasound is part of our protocol for estimating left ventricular filling pressures because we believe in utilizing multimodal approach to putting all these signs together to try to hopefully reach the good, the accurate diagnosis. Back to the algorithm, if the filling pressures are normal, you check the left ventricular and diastolic area. And if it's normal, it is likely to be a vasoplegic shock, and especially in the context of high stroke volume. But if the left ventricular and diastolic area is reduced, then it is likely a hypovolemic shock. And I, I finally finish by this slide mentioning the importance of the integrated approach where we integrate all the tools that we have. Looking at the neck veins, estimating the, the, the 
the, ve the, the veins, with, if the internal jugular vein is that collapsed, can also be an indicator for fluid status, but not a specific indicator. Looking at the lungs by, the, by ultrasound, estimating the, assessing the interstitial edema by looking at the B lines, looking at the pleura, looking at the IVC, and looking at the heart, and also looking at the systemic veins by the portal vein, renal vessels, and hepatic vein. And putting this all together only within the clinical context. We never use echocardiographic data outside the clinical context. If any of the data does not match your patient clinical and laboratory data, you have to be very careful when you use it. And those are my take home messages. I again stress on the importance of integrated approach because critically ill patients are complex and the more critical they are, the more devices they require, the more complex they become. So we should be careful about using all this information together in an integrated bedside approach. We need to, of course, understand pathophysiology in the critically ill patients because normal outpatient echocardiography is completely different from critical care echocardiography because, because critically ill patients have unpredictable changing and dynamic physiology. We should not blindly rely on numbers. We should always put these numbers carefully within the clinical context. And I personally believe that we are shifting away from the era of protocolized care, where one size fits all, to an era of individualized care, where we need to see what every patient needs. And we are fortunate because the development of ultrasound and echocardiography have been huge. And this is the best tool we can use to tailor the management to what every patient needs. And that's the, the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hatton, for this uh, lecture. Uh, again, I can't thank you enough for your uh, cooperation and your kindness. Uh, can we get back, please, to the slide of the integrated approach? I'd like to ask you something. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Uh, this one? No, the one before. Uh, the algorithm? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to ask you something. Yeah. Uh, from your experience, what do you do in these parameters, in all these parameters? Do you do them all or you no. rely on them? No, I don't. Uh, from my practical experience, I don't do. I don't. I don't do them all. So to assess filling pressures, I I would take it as a step by step situation. So the first thing, I do the E over E prime. This is my beginning. I, I so the tissue Doppler is a must if you want to assess filling pressures by echo. So E over E prime. And you, the, there is an equation which we have not mentioned here, which is that the Nagah formula, it's, it was proposed by uh, um, uh, a great uh, friend and uh, renowned uh, uh, Egyptian-American cardiologist, Professor Sharif Nagah, uh, for Houston Methodist, for United States, who was author of the, uh, the diastolic function guidelines. And I recommend you all, if you haven't read it already, that you should read it. He proposed a formula that was named after him, the Nagah formula. The Nagah formula, uh, uh, but all E over E prime plus four, give you estimation of the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And the formula was validated in patients with abnormally, uh, with structurally abnormal heart. So mainly patients with reduced ejection fraction, but also in patients with uh, uh, and I mean, this is from him to him to me. He told me this clearly after several discussions because I was wondering about patients with normal ejection fraction whether the formula still is is still validated or not. He said, but ac according to their work, that it is valid in any patient with a structurally abnormal heart, meaning that patients with diastolic dysfunction with significant degree of diastolic dysfunction, the formula will be valid. So the answer to your question, I mainly do the E over E prime and I do the lung ultrasound. If I see a frank pulmonary congestion and E over E prime uh, and wedge pressure estimation elevated, this is what I need. Because in the clinical context, it will confirm and what I need to know. But if E over E prime is not elevated and I'm still doubtful, 
and I see B lines on the on the lung ultrasound, then I go forward and assess the rest of the parameters, the left atrial volume, pulmonary venous um, uh, velocity, and the, the last thing will be left atrial strain. Thank you. I'd like to ask you another question. Yeah. Uh, I do have a patient with a um, severe aortic stenosis and he has a mid capillary obstruction already. Yeah. And I'm going to do, we will going to do him TAFI and we expect that he will go into suicidal LV. How do you approach such patient? We have lost one already because of this two years, about two years ago. He developed shock on the table. We started to give him fluid. Uh, someone uh, uh, suggested intravenous beta blocker. What would you do in this situation? I think if you, if I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very difficult and tricky situation. If you are uh, anticipating problem, and uh, this is a situation that you would anticipate problem, uh, I would bridge the patient if, if it's available. He could be bridged on uh, a, a modality of mechanical circulatory support, peri tavi. So it can be something that can be discussed with uh, the surgeons or the interventional cardiologists to support the, the left ventricle. It can be a form of a, a, a peripheral V ECMO because you know that the ventricle will be in trouble. I don't have answer to pharmacologically uh, supporting this ventricle because it may not be fully supported, especially if it's a critical aortic stenosis and you know that the ventricle will not cope with the TAVI. So, um, and we have actually seen um, several patients of this and some of them didn't survive and some of them did. But if we are really concerned, they, they put the patient on, uh, on ECMO. Yeah, ECMO. Peritavi. Uh, Peritavi. Yeah. Only as a bridge. Okay. Before the... Before the... Hello? Okay. Dr. Hatem, before the procedure. Hi, Dr. Tzad. Uh, would you put an LA cannula, a left HM cannula, or the regular right and uh, LV? And the like venting, left atrial venting. Yes. Ah, uh, I keep, طبعا, venting will be important. As like my ECMO, yeah. Yes. Ah, طبعا, طبعا. بس هو the venting مهم جدا. Uh, um, uh, by the time you initiate peripheral V ECMO, احنا مش ب... في الاغلب ما بنحطش lift um, atrial vent. في الاغلب ال venting approach بتاعنا بيكون impella. بس ال impella مش هتنفع في عيان عامل تافي وعنده critical aortic stenosis. فال options الموجودة هتبقى يا اما intra aortic balloon pump, لكن طبعا it will not be that effective as a venting solution, or the best solution will be the lift atrial vent. Definitely hatiba something helpful in reducing the, the left atrial pressure. Then in anticipating this left ventricle to get distended after peripheral V ECMO. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is one question from one of the audience. How can we assess significance of LVOT in some patients on mechanical ventilator? LVOT estimation, the LVOT VTI is not reliable at all in patients with dynamic LVOT obstruction. So this is one of the pitfalls. You should not use it. It doesn't matter if ventilated or not. Until I was continuously breathing. I will patient Andu Sam, I will trick LVOT obstruction you, sh you should not assess um, your TVTI. It will not be reliable. Okay, thank you. Fun. Uh, good evening, Dr. Hatim. Aran wa sahlan. Mahadardak Aran wa taz, mudarris alb fi ism alb al asraini. Kunti basa al-hatmanim bukhsus al-LV filling pressure al-E al Ibrahim fi al-Bishans al-Humma Bost Operative بيكون طبعا حضرتك عنده تكارديك وديستريسد وكده هل ده فاليد قياس الاي على الاي برايم وسبيشال حضرتك لما بيكون عندهم 
بروبلم في المايتر الانجلس او الترايكاسبيد انجلس او كده هل ده فاليد ان احنا نقيسه بوست اوبرتيف؟ لا طبعا في اهلا بحضرتك اولا دكتور يعني الحقيقه الحقيقه النقطه اللي حضرتك ذكرتها مهمه جدا ان احنا نحطها في ذهننا واحنا بنستيميت الاي اوفر اي برايم لان دي فاكتورز بتخلي الاي اوفر بالتحديد الاي برايم انريلايبل بعد المايترال فالف سيرجري لو في كافيري كالسيفيك انيولاس او الـ 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 يعني السيجنيفيكانت كاردي الفاكتورز دي كلها هتخلي الاي برايم انريلايبل للاسف علشان كده المالتي مودل اسسمنت اوف ذا هيستولوجي مهم جدا وانا شخصيا بعتبر اللانج الترا ساوند من ابسط واهم الحاجات اللي هتساعد في اللحظات دي لما انت يبقى عندك يعني شك في الداتا بتاعتك نتيجه الفاكتورز اللي حضرتك ذكرتها اللانج الترا ساوند بتديك كلو اكتر بتعرفك يعني انت لو انت لقيت الاي اوفر اي برايم مثلا اليفيتد مثلا كويس وبتحط البروب على اللانجز لقيت اي لاينز بايلاترالي يعني اللانج دراي خلاص انت عارف ان انت البيشنت از نوت كونجستد يو ار كونفيدنت ان البيشنت كونجستد نوت كونجستد فحاجة فهمت قصدي من نقطه يعني ومن هنا الانتجريشن كارديو بالمونري الترا ساوند مهم قوي بالتحديد في الحالات الامبيجوس اللي زي دي اللي فيها شويه كومبلكسيتيز سواء مايترال فالف سيرجري او مايترال انولار كالسيفيكيشن اتسترا ثانك يو دكتور حاتم وفيري اليجنت برزنتيشن ومنتظرين ان شاء الله محاضره عن اللانج الترا ساوند باذن الله يا دكتور شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا شكرا جدا يا دكتور حاتم لحضرتك فور ذيس برزنتيشن وزي ما قال معتز وي ار لوكينج فورورد فور ذا نيكست وان ان شاء الله ان شاء الله يا دكتور كريم شكرا جزيلا شكرا لحضرتك وخدنا من وقتك لا لا تحت امركم التوفيق ان شاء الله شكرا دكتور حاتم شكرا شكرا دكتور حاتم شكرا شكرا على خير مع السلامه مع السلامه